Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, big round of applause for B-Sides for having all these great talks. This is the last talk and I promise it's gonna be short, fun, and a great way to wrap everything up. So, looks like we're all set. Okay, my name is Nick. I am the CEO and Director of Alex Security. I am a penetration tester and I also um, start the Toronto Ethical Hacker Meetup Group, downtown Toronto. Uh, there's about 50 hackers, and uh, I noticed a couple of faces here, so hello to you guys. And um, I'm going to be just showcasing a lot of these tools and weapons as a penetration tester, as the red team. Um, so it's going to be about four tools and, uh, and actual physical devices, and uh, we're going to go from there. So I'm going to do a brief little overview of what is pen testing. For those of you who don't understand what it is, trying to wrap your head around, how is hacking legal? How can you do that? And uh, so it is a well-defined, organized security test. And it's not only limited to the IT department. So I know a lot of guys like to give a lot of heck to those network admins and uh, security execs. But security is everyone's responsibility. Um, it's a real-world objective test, in my, in my opinion. Uh, an external third-party system comes in and tests to their entire knowledge and their might to try to get into your system. Now, obviously, you can get different types of testing, white box, black box testing, gray box testing, but it all depends on the type of test that you're looking for with your system. Um, and the name of the game is to find the vulnerabilities and to see if you can exploit them. Uh, not all vulnerabilities are important. Um, you know, when it comes to pen testing, it's different than an antivirus scan because you can actually see where actual critical data lies. So if I were to actually exploit a vulnerability, I can then see, okay, I have some critical, like, key information here that I could use. So, and my number one vulnerability is the people in the company. So a lot of the tools that I'm going to be showing you are in a way, social engineers in themselves. So without further ado, I'm going to sort of talk about the methodology of penetration testing. So the very first is footprinting. There's an active and passive type of footprint uh, that you can do before you engage in a penetration test. So you always want to start with a passive test. This is utilizing Google, utilizing monster.ca to see if your target actually has any posts on, hey, this, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an IT guy. He needs to know MySQL, he needs to know PHP, he needs to know this you know, version of Windows Server. It's a great tool for me to actually see a posting like that so I can actually see what kind of technology a company is using. Afterwards, I can use more active scanning. I could use more active ping sweeps, uh, trace routes. The Gnosis vulnerability scan is great. Um, and then from there, I will go and conduct hacking. So my number one favorite type of hacking is just walking in the facility, dressed up as Onyx fire security tester. You know, I'm gonna go around, check your fire equipment, make sure everything's up to date. Oh, what's this, a server room. I wonder what it looks like in here. Um, and physical security, that's huge for me. Um, we always talk about IDS systems, IPS systems, but no one really looks at, you know, what are these physical security controls that we have protecting this infrastructure, protecting these digital files on these computers? So the first tool I want to show you guys is the USB rubber ducky. This guy has been around for a while, and I'm sure some of you guys know about him. Um, the great thing about this guy is he actually mimics a keyboard, and keyboards are inherently something that humans use and computers trust keyboards. But with this guy, he actually has an encoded payload that I can type in and I can put in whatever I want. Um, so some of the things that you can actually do with this guy is, let me just pass through here. You can use them for reconnaissance. So you can grab a, computer, a computer's ID, computer information, you can grab a user information based off of where you plug it in. Uh, you can get the installer updates, network scans, port scans. All of this is, can be used as a reconnaissance tool. You can also use it as like an active exploit or hacking. So you can do uh, a reverse SSH by just simply plugging it in. And uh, hopefully if it works properly. 
this should be the shortest demo ever. <laughs> Go ducky. <laughs> Done. I just wrote a reverse shell into a server that I have access to. So now I can go ahead and play around with all my files on this computer. Um, one of the really great things about this USB rubber ducky, let me just get back into the presentation, is it has a great community. Um, the guys over at Hack5 developed this. They have an awesome repository that allows you to just download little check marks that you can literally say like, hey, I want to grab the information, and it'll encode this in the actual Ducky encoder. Um, really great. Um, a lot of people online that are using it, and I highly recommend that you guys pick it up. Um, this is how much it goes for. Uh, it's about $42.99. If you buy one, you can get a discount if you keep going. The next tool that I'm going to be talking about is the Wi-Fi Fisher. Now, the Wi-Fi Fisher is similar to like a pineapple, uh, like a Wi-Fi pineapple, in the sense that what it uses is it uses these two Wi-Fi cards. And if they're capable of injection, you can conduct the actual hack. So what I would use this in a penetration test is I would sit outside of a, a corporate parking lot or outside of the actual door, and I would try to actually de-authenticate the <coughs> company's router um, and all of their clients attached to it. And then the other uh, access point would try to mimic the router. It would try to grab its SSID and it would try its best to um, display an actual web server for the clients that were trying to reconnect to the router. Um, they would actually be shown a, a fake sort of router firmware update screen where they're asked for their WPA or WEP password in order to run the firmware update. So the, the great thing about this type of tool and this, this hack is that it uses the social engineering technique of you need to update your, your router. And anyone who is connected to this router can do this. And if I'm listening, I could essentially just take one person, grab the password, and the entire network's compromised. Just a little picture of how it kind of works. So like I said, all it takes is just one person uh, to fall victim to the attack and the entire network becomes compromised. And I don't even care about the encryption standard you use, whether it's WP, uh, WPA2, WPA, doesn't matter. Um, it is open source, uh, Python, you can grab it on uh, GitHub. And this is kind of what it looks like when you actually plug it in. You can see here it'll automatically scan and put one of the cards into monitor mode. And it'll try to actually pick up all of the SSIDs in your, in your area. Uh, what you'll then do is then do a tiny little keystroke of what, what uh, access point you want to attack. First, it'll try to clone all of the settings. Then it'll actually jam the devices connected to it. It'll deauthenticate and bring everyone down. Now, the one thing that I learned about this type of attack is you need to have a higher power gain than the router. So you need to be really close to these to these targets. That's why I said, you know, I'm outside of the parking lot, or if I could, kind of like post up like really close to the building itself. And then at the bottom you can see where the web server is actually running. And uh, I can see the get and post requests from the clients that actually fall for this wonderful website here. I don't even know. They just chose some random product DSL. Whatever. I'm sure that you can customize it yourself because it is all open source, but this, this does the trick, trust me. So the requirements, um, this thing usually runs in a Kali Linux environment, um, and you need two network cards, not just one. You need one to do the deauthentication and the other one to do the injection and to actually broadcast the web server. Um, these uh, TP links, they're great, you know, 150 megabytes per second. They're about $12. Really great. The third tool is um, this guy right here. Um, he is the USB Ethernet adapter, uh, also known as the LAN turtle, the physical man in the middle device. So he'll actually grab um, an IP address from 
the DHCP server from whatever network, and it'll actually pump out a different IP address to whatever computer I connect it to. Um, some of the things that you can do with this are incredible. You, there's a whole bunch of uh, actual modules that you can download online. You can do URL snarfing, DNF spoofing, really great device. Um, some of the things that you can um, really use this for is um, like a persistent sort of after the fact that you've hacked into your company. You go in and you plug this into their infrastructure, it'll act as like a persistent auto SSH. So you'll automatically have access to this entire LAN whenever you want. You know, it, <laughs> it actually says USB Ethernet adapter. So I guarantee if I just put this around somewhere in a company, someone's gonna say, hey, I'm totally gonna plug this in and just like get some Ethernet. <laughs> And uh, for the last, the legendary hacking tool of lock picking. So when it comes to physical security, we have our cameras, our biometric scanners, the man traps, RFID tags, the motion detectors, but the number one most common physical security system is your typical lock. You know, these locks can be found on doors, executive offices, even the server rack will have a lock to protect all of its cables and stuff. So the art of picking a lock. Um, not sure if anyone really here also does lock picking. It is not illegal in Canada to actually have one of these devices here. Uh, I'm going to give you, yeah. <laughs> so here you guys can see that um, I have all of my actual rakes, tools. I have my tension wrenches all in this wonderful little pouch here, but I rarely use this. The tool that I'm gonna be showcasing to you guys when it comes to lock picking is the snap gun. The snap gun works off of transmitting kinetic in, uh, infra, uh, energy from the steel rod of the snap gun here into the bottom pins of the lock. The bottom pins receive that energy and use the inertia to hit the pins that are right above the shear uh, level of the actual lock. So when I go into the lock and I do that a couple of times, I'm actually knocking the pins into place. And they stay there because I'm applying with one of my tension wrenches at the bottom of the lock a constant force. So when I go in just like that, eventually that door actually opens within just 10 to 30 seconds. The reason why I brought the honey goo is because this works a lot better than WD-40. So if you guys are looking into doing it, honey goo. Honey goo. Um, another one of the actual devices here that go with the um, USB rubber ducky is this tiny little uh, USB adapter that allows you to plug it into uh, an Android device. And Androids also accept keyboard strokes. So you can conduct USB rubber ducky hacks on mobile phones. Um, now, the way that you actually encode the payload in the USB rubber ducky, sorry, I'm like jumping around a little bit, is with this device here. So you can't just plug in that USB rubber ducky um, into any device and start writing to it. Um, it has a small little tiny micro SD slot card, and you take that out and you plug it into here, and then you plug that into your computer, and you can write whatever code you want. Here's a little demo of the actual snap gun. Also, we want to point out that it does make sense and a good and offset tip for upside down mounted cylinders. But look at how long that video is. It, and he's explaining it as he goes along. It takes no time at all for him to get into that deadbolt lock. No time at all. 
I'm not connected, guys. Like, yeah. like, the presentations are going to be actually showcased um, afterwards. Besides, is going to host it, so you guys will have all the access to, to these links on the, on the slide. Any questions? I know I was going to keep it short, sweet, demo some of these tools for you. <laughs> questions, questions, questions. Most used tool, um, my resume. <laughs> yes. You demonstrated the USB rubber ducky on the like, you brought up Spotlight yourself. Is there any way you can have the rubber ducky bring up Spotlight? Now, the rubber ducky, uh, a lot of the um, people that are part of the community, they actually write the encoded payloads in, in Windows. However, when they tried to actually bring up that command button, the keystroke in, in Mac, it does not work. So I tried looking at it, and I tried actually finding a way to to mimic that keystroke for the command button, but it, like the the rubber ducky tries its best to hit the um, the Windows button. So that's why I started off with Spotlight, and it automatically typed terminal for me and went from there. Yeah, and I, I can see how, how it is suspicious. Um, the Wi-Fi Fisher isn't a tool that I, I use regularly. I'll, I'll mainly use the Air, air Crack suite, um, especially if I see like a, a WEP um, connection. And um, But Wi-Fi Fisher will bring down, or at least try to redirect all, all the users to me. And all I need is just one password. It's a it's a it's like a it's a two way attack. So it does attack the AP and it does attack yeah, the it user. Hits the AP. It, it, it hits the AP. Yeah, it hits the AP and I and I send the deauth packet and then just deauthenticates them. Yes. That's something that I was trying to experiment with earlier before the talk, and uh, I believe so. But I'm gonna get back to you. What's up? Yeah, awesome. I'm going to go over to this side of the room. Over in the back there. So the question was, um, is it just raw output or? So, yeah, so what the rubber ducky allows for um, you can you can utilize it for like mass storage device media, and you can actually write to the rubber ducky based off of you know what you find. So if I use it for like a reconnaissance mission, and I plug it into someone's computer or someone's laptop, I could actually grab information on their laptop, and and during the process, not so much. Um, it would, yeah. Um, but what you could do is if you have the file already loaded on the rubber ducky, there's a little tiny button on the rubber ducky itself that allows you to redo the payload again, and once you press that button, you can just write a simple condition that, that says, if that file is there, run it differently. Yes? Um, I've seen a couple of individuals use the rubber ducky for um, booting into uh, a Windows machine that isn't encrypted, or not a Windows, a Mac machine that is not encrypted in a single user mode and was able to actually get into the, because you have to type in a whole bunch of commands in single user mode, and if you just plug in the rubber ducky, you can get right in, get root access. So during during my, like my my day to day, like when I'm working with like uh, like small and medium sized businesses, these tools here, uh, they aren't tools that I use all the time. Um, I brought these these like these guys up here because I find them as more 
like toys and I just wanted to demo them for you guys and sort of showcase that these are easy to get. Like people can buy them online. They can start plugging them into your networks. These are things that we have to be, you know, reasonable and, and understand. But um, some of the tools that I do use every day, Kali Linux, um, Core Impact, uh, it's great for a lot of um, reporting afterwards. Um, Nmap, it's the best. Uh, yes, over here. Um, yeah, so lock, lock picking is, is legal. Uh, to have the actual lock pick sets are, are legal in Canada, um, but how you use them and what you use them on. Like, I could not... Um, so this gun only works on one-sided locks, uh, on locks that have pins on the top. Um, your typical car will have pins that are located on the top and the bottom. They're, they're dual pin locks. Um, the gun won't work for those type of locks. Uh, I'm sure that there might be some people out there who are like grand locksmiths that can find a way to do it, or they use just their hands, um, but they would actually use the, the, the actual picks themselves and not the gun for, for you know, really intense locks like that. What about two guns? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that would work. <laughs> yes. No, the the ones that are bump key resistant, it would it would not work. Um, you would need to actually have the skillful hands of, of traditional lock picking. Yes, over here. Question about the uh, Wi Fi uh, hack. Have you done anything with uh, WPH or WPH2 Enterprise authentication and uh, have you added any compatible snapshots? Uh, those actually require a couple more inputs than just you know a single password. Uh, so I haven't actually used the Wi-Fi Fisher for any of those networks. How about WPA2? Yeah, just just if if it requires just like one single password, that's it. it it's pretty simple. Um, like Wi-Fi Fisher is built to just receive that one entry, and the UI front end, it just works. Um, I also have a ex like back end like full stack development experience, mm -hmm. but um, I I'd much rather break things now. <laughs> <laughs> One more question? Yes. The contract. <laughs> okay. Okay, so before you disappear, you get to give away a $50 ebook gift voucher from No Starch Press to the uh, whoever had the question you thought was worthy. Yes. Huh? Uh, worthy, worthy is. I'm tired, dude. Don't bag on me.